Welcome to Lynn Cullen Live at PGHCityPaper.com. Email your questions and comments to Lynn at PGHCityPaper.com. Oh, hello, 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 hello. And yet again. Hi. How you doing? We made it again. It's another Friday, and uh, it be the 21st, the first Friday of spring. <laughs> Snow predicted next week. Uh, I, 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 even I am, I'm had, okay, don't talk about the weather, Colin, don't talk about the weather, nobody cares. But it is something we share in common. It is why people talk about the weather when they can't think of anything else to talk about because... Again, it is something we have in common. Well, uh, something we have in common is that Chris Potter will not be uh, here today. He's uh, off doing his other gig, (laughs) which is reportage. At least that's what he says. Um, Something we all have in common is this sense that I think we know an awful lot and that in this extraordinary world uh, of technological advancement that an awful lot is known about us (laughs) as well. And so this sense of, you know, big brother, both uh, corporate and political, uh, being out there and watching our every move and knowing where we are. I mean, this is very, I, I think it's just a given, right? I, and I do think that that is why the disappearance of this plane has cost so much I think angst. It's unsettling. It's unsettling to us because our sense of our world today is that we can't hide. So how the hell can this huge thing with 200 plus souls uh, in it simply vanish? We got satellites, we got drones, we got tracking this, tracking that. And um, how the hell does this happen? Listening to all the speculation has uh, in itself been entertaining and somewhat educational. All the things that could have gone wrong. But I think we, in, in, the, in this specific case, might end up never really having the satisfaction of knowing. And to a people who are a bunch of know-it-alls, who have this sense that we're supposed to have access to all information, and if not us, then you know, them, certainly. And I think this time, maybe not. And there's a eh, interesting piece in the New York Times today written by a guy with an unpronounceable name uh, who is a distinguished, it says, presidential fellow at Chapman University, wherever that is. And It is titled, The Folly of Thinking We Know. He says, it is our nature to overestimate how much we understand the world and to underestimate the world, excuse me, the role of chance. We overestimate our understanding of the world and underestimate the unknown, the role of chance. And it is our folly, he says, to assume that we know very much at all. 
Whatever the field of our expertise, most of us realize that the more data we acquire, the less very often we know. The universe is not a fixed sum in which the amount you know subtracts from the amount you don't. And I think he's absolutely right. And I want to go back and read that one sentence again because it absolutely echoes what former New York Times reporter and Pulitzer Prize winning author David K. Shipler, who was a guest on this show last week, said about all of the data that the NSA is taking in and that the CIA takes in. And he said that that data is, is, is so huge and we don't, if, you drown, if you're drowning in data, you actually don't know much of anything. There's nothing selective going on. So this guy is absolutely echoing that when he says whatever the field of our expertise, most of us realize that the more data we acquire, the less very often we know. I went to uh, hear David Shipler speak uh, on Sunday. He was uh, here speaking at an ACLU event. And he, he had a little quote that really brings it home. He said, if looking in for a needle in a haystack is a metaphor for something well nigh impossible, then how is making the haystack bigger going to help? And that's the argument against this sort of just metadata gathering. You're just making the haystack bigger. And it's making your chance of finding that thing that you purportedly are looking for more and more or less likely. It doesn't make sense to make the haystack bigger. And he points out that it has been humbling, this plain thing. Humbling. To see the entire globe and all of the assets of all the countries and all the smartest people in the universe who know how to hunt this kind of thing, it has been humbling in this age of unprecedented data accumulation, of unprecedented haystacks, that whatever it is we think we know, it apparently ain't anywhere near enough. So I love it when we're humbled. I do. I love it when Mother Nature humbles us because uh, we should be put in our place <laughs> a lot, I think. We get a little full of ourselves. Do we not? And the airplane thing puts us in our place. which is a humbling place. Mere mortals, that's it. But speaking of that, I did hear some interesting uh, speculation about what maybe could have happened on the plane. I hadn't heard this one before. It was carrying in its cargo, apparently, um, a shipment of lithium batteries. Hi, Jess. Hi. Well, how? <sighs> Great. Bye, Carlo. Bye, Carlo. You guys didn't know, but Jess wasn't here, and Carlo was here in her stead. My hero. 
And here is Jess. Hi, how are you? Jess. <laughs> She's not feeling well. You need sleep. Sleep. Pretends to dream, my dear. Okay. So where are we going? Where are we going? Where are we going? Anyway, I I, I find all of this in. Oh, 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 lithium batteries. And apparently lithium batteries are extremely hazardous and could have ignited, I guess. And then you could have had this, like, whoosh, fire or bzz, an incapacitation of the crew, of uh, all the passengers, and hence uh, a, 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 an, airline, a, an airplane flying itself until it simply runs out of fuel. And pff, maybe. And then again, maybe not. Oops. Speaking of, uh, I think I said Big Brother before, uh, someone gave me an interesting piece uh, from Mensa magazine. Oh, the person who gave this to me is smart. You, any of you guys belong to Mensa? I mean, I, I never tried. I know there's a test you take. I guess it's an IQ test, isn't it? If you have a certain IQ, you get in. Is that... The, uh, at any rate, I mean, somebody could have a high IQ but be a friggin' fool. I, I don't see IQ as an indicator of worthiness in any way. I don't see IQ as an indicator, uh, a major indicator of whether or not, for instance, just I would want to hang with you. I don't see IQ as something that meaning you're a good person or an interesting person or anything. So I just don't find it a particularly interesting marker. It is a marker that people can use to brag, obviously, those who have high ones. Um, <laughs> but I really think some of the most pathetic human beings that I have ever met have been people, often, with very high IQs, who are just sort of they have no emotional intelligence, you know? They got smarts up here, but they don't know how to relate to people. They're not particularly sociable or engaging. And <laughs> But we need all kinds. Anyway, uh, a guy that I, I, I have interviewed long ago in the past, like very much, Richard Letterer, who is a word maven, has written uh, a piece. And he talks about... Uh, never forgetting the lessons of uh, George Orwell's 1984. And he says that one of those obvious lessons is how language can be used to control people and to control thought. Um, in, I don't know, it's been a long time since I read 1984. But in 1984, privacy is gone. There, you're being watched. The people are being watched all the time. Um, the government has an ability uh, to, um, well, they create a new language, and it's called new speak. The language I'm talking right now would have been old speak, and new speak has a, m fewer words. <laughs> A lot fewer words. Because one of the goals of Newspeak in Orwell's 1984 is to, is to diminish the value, the ability of language to create complex thought, to, to explain complex complex things. Um, so a lot of words that are, can nuance an idea uh, disappear in, in Newspeak. And, and the size of uh, the average person's vocabulary shrinks and shrinks and shrinks. And there is evidence that that is something happening to us now 
letterer rights. And we sort of touched on it yesterday when at the end of the show we were talking about how the SATs now are not quizzing anymore on these, you know, sort of a four and five syllable words that we don't on average use a lot, but that are important words, you know? And and then Lederer goes on, and I have to tell you this, you talk about humbling. I was mortified and humbled because he says this. Evidence of this insidious process of us sort of giving up words, letting them go, and shrinking our vocabulary, he says, evidence is all around us. And he says, news speak happens when people cannot distinguish between two like words so that they just sort of become one. And the nuances of those two different words are lost. And I do remember arguing with somebody. Somebody called my show, God, how long ago was it? It has to be 20 years ago, 25 years ago, and said, why are you always using such big words that I don't understand? You just trying to show off? And I said, oh, my God, no. Those are words in my head. And when I'm talking, I root around for the word that's going to most accurately describe the thought or help me convey the thought that I have. And the more words I have at my disposal, the better chance I have of really saying what I'm thinking and what I mean. Anyway, this is why I was so flipped out when Letterer said this. Newspeak happens when the original meaning of unique becomes identical with the word unusual. And he says that is what has happened. So people say, wow, that was a unique experience, right? We do that. That was so unique, and we don't mean unique, because unique is one of a kind. Never happened before. Never going to happen again. Unique is like way up there. You shouldn't use it very often, because there's very few times when something truly is unique. Although, a lot of things are unusual. So he says, unique, unusual, and yet... That distinction between the two of them is already essentially gone. So I got that one, but then he comes up with a bunch of other pairs of words that have blurred their meanings and so that we don't, we don't make any distinction, most of us, between the two of them. And you know what? He's right. Here's some of his pairings. Compose and comprise. Well, this is composed of blah, 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 blah. Or this is comprised of blah, 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 blah. I think I use those two interchangeably. I don't often use comprise. Never use comprise. Yeah, I, I don't. <laughs> but he's clearly telling us they don't really mean the same. Compose and comprise. Here's another reluctant and reticent. Uh, I think of reticence as reluctance. Me too. So does Jess. How about you? Wrong. Richard Letterer <laughs> says, eh, eh, there's a difference. And these words are losing their strength by our inability to understand their true meaning. Um, this one I know. Because I, this one, this one blew my mind when I first found out what it really meant. Energized and enervated. I don't know enervated. You don't know enervated. It sounds, if you were to read it in a sentence, you would, you would figure you understood what it meant, right? Just because of its mm -hmm. enervate. Uh, you would see, and she was enervated by, um, by the struggle. Enervate means exactly the opposite 
of energize. It means depleted. So energized and enervated. And then the one I'm always squawking about, and this one I do know, less and fewer. <laughs> And I don't, I don't know if I can explain the difference. I, my ear just absolutely knows it. I, I, and I, you know how that sometimes is the case. Or um, he says, new speak happens when we say momentarily, when we mean presently. And presently when we mean now. What do you mean? Doesn't presently mean now? Apparently not. So we, and you know, I like to think of myself as a, you know, somebody who really values language. <laughs> Apparently, I'm part of the, its decline. So, there you go. He says, Orwell, more than any other writer, warned us that dishonest language is a drug that can put conscience to sleep. He alerted us that when words are used to lie rather than tell the truth, the house of language grows dark and the human spirit withers. Some of his other pairings, uninterested and disinterested, I'm uh, vaguely aware there's a difference there, yeah. And I think I would use disinterested differently in a sentence. But again, I can never explain. Affect and eff effect. Oh, those are uh, affect and effect. Yeah. Those give me trouble to this day. Really? Um, yeah, and uh, whatever. And farther and further. Now, I think that's just a grammatical thing. I think that's just grammatical. I think farther has to do with distance. Further does not have to do with distance. It has to do with whatever farther doesn't have to do with. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. And I'll give you one last one, which is verbal and oral. Oh, no, those are the same thing. He says they're not. You just put that in your pipe and smoke it, okay? And I'll take a break. Way with Lynn Cullen Live. Bergbargains.com is your best bet for great deals on the Berg. Log on today for exclusive bargains from your favorite local restaurants like Blue Line Grill, Atria's, and Verde. Plus discounts on tickets to Tammy Pescatelli at the Improv. Bergbargains.com, Pittsburgh's best bargains. Bergbargains.com. Hi, I'm LeVar Burton, and I'm proud to be a book person. How do I choose a book? Sometimes it's the cover, sometimes it's the title. I guess I'm pretty visual. If a book's really impressing me and the writing is really good, I will peek and see what the last paragraph is because the endings of books should rock you. I am a book person, and if you're a book person too, read to a child and spark a lifetime of ambition. Join me at bookpeopleunite.org because reading is fundamental. A public service announcement brought to you by Reading is Fundamental, Library of Congress and the Ad Council. Now, it's back to Lynn Cullen Live at pghcitypaper.com. Okay, uh, this, um, boy, I must be reading the wrong newspapers. Uh, Joe writes, So it turns out that Ravenstahl returned the Waterford Crystal Award to the FBI over a week ago. Really? Yeah, you didn't hear that either? I didn't hear that. You heard that? I mean, we were suge I was suggesting that if they wanted to find it, it and the blue vase and all that other crap that went missing, uh, that Ravenstahl and probably took it. But I didn't hear he turned that over. I only heard the computer going back. Um, and Joe writes, so it turns out Ravenstahl returned the Crystal uh, Bowl Award to the FBI over a week ago, and we're just finding this out now? Where did you find it out, Joe? Why didn't his lawyer tell us this earlier this week? Where's the rest of the stuff? And as a result of all the news stories, Ravenstahl is saying that Peduto is libeling his good name. 
What good name? <laughs> Hello, caller. So, in other words, with the difference between oral and verbal, so you were just having verbal sex with the and <laughs> oral and verbal. Well, you know, you don't have verbal sex; you have oral sex. Well, you think that's, that's the, the only di- that that can't be the only difference. Well, that's a great example. One is with the mouth. One is one is spoken. One is with the mouth. So, although you speak with your mouth, um, it's, it has to do with words. Uh, I often thought Frank Lutz is the guy that comes up with things like death tax um, instead of estate tax. Yeah, he's a, he, he, he knows how I, to... I always thought his book should have been titled Sticks and Stones Can Break My Bones, But Words Can Win an Election. Or, um, or we're, how, how, how semantics destroy the country. Right, words can destroy, uh, yeah, the country. I mean, um, that's, that's Frank Lutz has made a career yeah, doing that. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And about the... Um, about the the, the, the plane missing. Um, I have a friend that asked me one time if, if he, 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 said, he said to me he thought that fear was the root of the human condition. And um, I said, I don't think it is. I think, it's, I think it's understanding. Wanting to understand is the root of the human condition. And fear springs from that. And I, I think, um, you know, we strive to understand. That's why we create things like God. Um, because how else do you explain something? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I think God uh, or gods um, have been, yes, what humans have invented to deal with their fear, apprehension, confusion. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I mean, that... there, there are many, many things. Well, you know, 9-11, something like 9-11 happened. Oh, my God, it's pure evil. It's Satan incarnate. We just have a hard time understanding how bad things can happen just out of the blue. And they do. It happens all the time to people. And I but guess we have we, to put understanding on it. We yeah, have to try to right. wrap Be, our minds around it. Because there, and that leads to fear to a large extent. I agree. The reality of life is that it is chaotic. There's chaos out there. There's, you know, we lo- we can't live, most people can't live with that. Um, and, and well, that's they, what life is based on. Chaos. Right. I mean, that's chaos. How, that's how, well, <laughs> depending on what side of the the scientific or, or um, theological yeah. spectrum you come from, chaos is what creates evolution. That's right. So the more, sure. but the more, uh, so, so the more, some people have more tolerance for living uh, with uh, an unsettled reality, and they're more able to keep their balance and or enjoy that kind of a ride. I'm one of those. Sure, and then yeah, there's, and then there are the, there's the other side that don't like change, like right. they know things are going to be happen when it's expected right. to happen. Right, those are rural um, people. Brings them fear, right. much, much fear. Right. I give you the tea party. Yeah, I know. Um, I'm not gonna. I'm gonna try not to put a value judgment on it because I think you're sort of born with one of those uh, uh, personality traits or the or the other. And the people who do need structure and a lot of it and rules and black and white and this is right and all kinds of you know uh, whatever explanations from people about everything they're confused about. Um, my only problem with those people is that they have a tendency to want to impose their structures on larger and larger groups. Uh, con- sure, yeah. Con- well, and, uh, you know, I, you're, you're right about not putting value. I mean, I am that way personally, but the thing is, is that I understand, I understand that it, it's about self-awareness. So it's, be, be that way. Be, be, you know, don't, you cannot like change. You can, you can be afraid of the unknown or whatever, but you have to be aware that you are that way and that you shouldn't, and therefore you're able not to try to impose that on the outside world, you know? Yeah. And well, I grew up watching stories about the Bermuda Triangle, not saying that this is some freakish occurrence with that airplane. But I grew up watching, you know, shows like In Search Of and all those That's Incredible and those strange Ripley's Blue or not those strange right, things. So right. I'm aware of the fact that things like this have happened year for years. And now, like you said, we just think we're so in control that something like this could not happen 
you know, unfortunately, it's a wake up call, but it comes at the cost of all the passengers on the plane. It was, it's an, unfortunately, we can't figure out a different way to do that. No, they're, really they're, they're gone. They're gone. All right. Hey, thank you for the call. I appreciate it. Uh, there's so much to talk about, and I don't even know where to start. I had a little bit of a, I, I'll just say this about the uh, general who was charged with, uh, you know, all the sexual uh, assault and misconduct and adultery and stuff. And there is a, a great deal of shock about his sentence. I mean, he did a plea bargain. His defense lawyers and the prosecution uh, sat down and uh figured out what they both agreed to would be a okay outcome. And his lawyers agreed to an outcome that would give him no more than 18 months in jail and loss of rank and I think possible loss of everything, his pension, everything. And so he went into the sentencing fully expecting that he'd be going to jail and may well in fact and the judge didn't give him a a second in jail. He keeps his pension. He pays a fine. And this is what the milita- military justice does when everybody is watching every step of the way. Can you imagine what military justice must be like in these sexual assault cases when nobody's paying any attention at all? This is what they do when they know there is this increasing sense, including in the Senate of the United States, that they've got a problem here. It's striking, but what really freaked me out was that in the way it fell into the Post-Gazette, there was the story of the general. Oh, no, that's not true. There, there, there's the general's picture, and then there's this story, front page, about some woman from Bethel Park who's going to jail for th- for 30 days in the county jail and she's going to be in house arrest for eight more months and she stole $19,000 from um, the Bethel Park Junior Cheerleaders Organization. Okay? She was in charge of the money they had and she was embezzling it. She got caught. Okay, so for embezzling about 19000 which, by the way, she came to court yesterday for her sentencing with a check for 19000 She was paying it all back. She's going to jail. <laughs> and maybe she should, but God, if, if, a, if this woman from Bethel Park who uh, was depressed and a little and it was st- stealing from cheerleaders apparently in Bethel Park is a lot more egregious a crime than uh, sexually uh, assaulting your underlings in the uh, military. Uh, caller, hi. Hey, Len, it's Mike from D.C. Hi, Mike. What the military doesn't get about sexual assault is that it's not about sex, it's about power. power. Apparently, the reason this general got off is because the victim um, had had sex after she had been attacked. So they say, well, then it's not really rape because she went back. Yeah, so but they were... think it has something to do with sex as opposed to the abuse of power. Right. And sex being the way these men do it. Right. There well, are people do it. Right. But there was also this, it wasn't just her. He had admitted to absolute sexual impropriety with other junior officers, female, under his command. It didn't rise to the level of rape, but it it was, you know, send me pictures of yourself in various states of, un- I mean, this is, yeah, it it's just classic sexual harassment at the very least. And it's abuse of power. That's what the military doesn't get. Is that I understand. It doesn't have to do with 
penis, vagina, penis, penis. It has to do with you are in control or power over these people, and you use that to, uh, to um, get something that you want from these people. Right. They are not in a and position think, to turn you down. Yeah, and that movie that you wanted everybody to watch about this issue, I watched it and was shocked. The Invisible War. The, the Invisible War. Yeah. Every, I was shocked. It wasn't that. It, is that not? It, that is that movie is responsible. That documentary is responsible for opening the eyes of uh, of senators to this issue. And so, it was do you think if do you think if one of the women who were raped, instead of saying I was raped by this captain, they said this captain beat me up? Do you think that there would be more? Um, Punishment. Yeah, if they were told they were beat up and if they had had sex. Right, I do. I do because that takes, as you said, that uh, it takes the penis out of the picture. I think probably true because that's understandable abuse of power in every form. But men and women and sex, I don't know. They don't get it. Thanks for your... said the reason they, they, want, they didn't want to let gays and lesbians into the military was because they would treat, gays would treat the men like the men treat the women. And the straight men were afraid of that. Yeah. Right. That's it. Thanks for the call. So anyway, Bye. You're welcome. Bye. Bye. Uh, Jen writes, I work in a hospital and most of the docs have multiple mistresses. These doctors are grossly unattractive. How do they get the ladies? Easy answer, power. <coughs> but, right, women are attracted to powerful men. That just goes with our evolutionary thing. You know, a woman wants a powerful male, a female wants a powerful male to protect her and her cubs. Call her, go ahead. How are you doing today? I'm okay. Now, I've been fortunate. I've been married 37 years, happily married. But I can really say that most men are friggin' pigs. I worked with them. They see a woman in a skirt, nice legs, and they, they're all hot and bothered. I mean, it's pathetic. And this is just what's going on in the military. These guys can't control themselves around women. And there are men like that, that they just have to have that woman. It, it's so disgusting. That's my opinion on the whole thing. And when you have men and women like that, that's what you're going to have. It's a, it's a damn shame, but that's how they are. Isn't there any way to uh, to drag men into a, a more enlightened uh, area? Get them... I mean, do women just have to tolerate this? Maybe they should give them some medicine. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, my God, it's snowing. Uh Okay, well, th- thank you for your call. I'm not going to argue with your assessment no, of, of your I, gender. Yep. We'll yeah. see you. Okay, bye. Oh, God. And what else? I've got, I'm sorry, I'm just sitting here. All right, papers around. I'm waiting for this stupid computer to bring up some information. Uh, While the charges against General Sinclair carried a maximum of more than 20 years in prison, the plea bargain worked out by the defense and the prosecution called for no more than 18 months. The judge, however, did not explain how he arrived at no time at all. And prosecutors didn't say anything. And uh, that's that. They said to strip him, the prosecutors had argued that uh, to strip uh, Sinclair of his benefits, that that would harm, punish his wife and their two sons rather than the general. Well, if that argument were the case... So, 
I wonder if Joe Schmo can make that argument uh, when he's facing jail time. Judge, if you put me in jail, who's going to, I got to work to support my wife and children. That's, that kind of sensitivity is not, uh, is not evident in uh, normal workings of crime and punishment in this country. But when it comes to generals, I guess we get a whole different kind of justice. And actually, let me quote a guy who teaches military justice at uh, Yale's law school. This is Eugene Fidel. He said, enlisted personnel will argue that this, Sinclair getting off, is another case of disparate treatment between senior officers and everyone else, and they will have a point. This will ratchet up concern that there is first-class justice, for some, and steerage for the rest. And so we are apprised one more time that life ain't fair and that the powerful and connected do not pay like we do, like average people, like people who pilfer money from cheerleaders. It's amazing, really. And every time our, boy, it's really snowing now. Was this supposed to happen? No, I didn't even wear a coat today. You didn't even wear a coat. And that's why you're sick all the time. Oh, well. I didn't wear much of a coat. In fact, this is my coat. I'm wearing, I never took it off because it's so cold in here. Yeah, I didn't. Yeah, no, I forgot. I really didn't quite wear a coat either. What the? What the? Okay, I'm going to take a break and, 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 and swear at the window a little more, and then we'll talk some more. Stick around for more with Lynn Cullen Live after this. Pittsburgh City Paper's annual music guide is available now. Pick up one today for a look at music education in city schools. Gary Newman, Ted Pappas, and Hart. Plus, don't miss your chance to win cash in our bracket contest. Pittsburgh City Paper, available at over 1,700 locations throughout western Pennsylvania and on the web at pghcitypaper.com, your smartphone at citypapermobile.com, and at the iPhone App Store and Google Play. Here at the GED Pep Talk Center, we've got a pep talk that can motivate you. Sometimes things don't always turn out the way you want them to. You can improve your future. Now get your game face on and take the first step towards a better life. Hurry up. Don't make me repeat myself. Whatever level of motivation you need, we've got a pep talk for you. Call 1-877-38-YOUR-GED or visit yourged.org for your pep talk and for free classes in your area. GED is a registered trademark of the American Council on Education. Brought to you by Dollar General Literacy Foundation and the Ad Council. Have a question or an opinion? Call Lynn Cullen at 412-316-3381 or email lynn at pghcitypaper.com. Now, more with Lynn Cullen Live. At least one of the items missing from the office of the Pittsburgh mayor has now been returned. Joseph has sent me what he... Uh, the Waterford Crystal Trophy which commemorates the Steelers' 2006 Super Bowl win, has been missing until now. But sources confirm former Mayor Luke Ravenstahl and his attorney, Chuck Porter, met with the FBI a little over a week ago, and at that time, Ravenstahl returned the bowl. Sources confirm the FBI still has it. Um... Mayor Bill Peduto said it's one of only a few pieces, one of the more valuable pieces missing as well. I don't know what that means. Uh, he, Peduto says he provided the FBI with a detailed list of what was taken from the office or left behind and damaged. We sent a list of both property that was damaged and property that is missing. 
uh, estimates of the value all around is about $200,000. Sources confirm the FBI questioned Ravenstahl <laughs> regarding the list. They say the mayor was very cooperative, but he can only brought back this Super Bowl trophy, nothing else. So maybe somebody else has all the other stuff. Uh, sources also confirm U.S. Attorney David Hickton told Ravenstahl and his attorney that this case is out of our jurisdiction. S well, then why are they holding the bowl? Give it back to the mayors, the, the real mayor. Sources confirm that Ravenstahl believes his name is being ruined, that he has been slandered and significant lies have been spread about him. Well, wait a minute. He's already admitted to having taken the computer and taken the bowl, both of which he has returned. He wouldn't have if there hadn't been this report made to the FBI. So, what? Unbelievable. Um, also, just getting some of your uh, email. Do you know Starbucks? Does Starbucks uh, that you go to sell uh, booze? Mm -mm. It's going to. Starbucks is going to uh, begin. They want a bigger audience. They want more customers. And coffee drinkers have made them rich, but they want the wine and beer drinkers uh, coming up. And they figure that uh, people will in fact, um, come even more night now, morning, noon, and night. All right, Ray has checked in. Lynn, I feel these diatribes about words are often just we old people bitching about how these youngsters these days don't appreciate how smart we used to be. <laughs> I don't think that's quite it. I would bet Jess has a whole vocabulary that I would find incomprehensible. Probably. You think? Okay, come up with one. I don't know. Oh, because you don't know. You just use them. Yeah. It's, you mean current slang and nomenclature-ish kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't know. Well, well, I say, instead of saying, like, right now, yeah. I'll say right meow. I'll say meow instead of now. I say that. Instead say of saying right now, you say right meow? <laughs> yeah. Well, what? I don't think that's what he meant. And I also say, I, I abbreviate all uh -huh. words. Such as? So, like totes. Totes. Instead of totally. Instead of totally. Yeah. Yeah! And like. I hate stuff like that. Okay, what else? <laughs> Instead of saying, like, special or precious, I'll say, like, speshy or preshy. Oh, Jess, I'm going to th <laughs> throw something at you. Doc! I know. Why? Um, I don't really But know. that's just individual. That's not something you're doing that Maybe other it, people do? Yeah, it is in, like, a sort of, I think, <laughs> like, 20 to 40 age range in the type, I don't know, I... I can't explain it. All right. Well, I have to admit, sometimes when I hear my son uh, talking, I don't always understand everything he's saying because there is a, a different lingo for younger people. Oh, but that sounds so femmy, what you're doing. Spashy. <laughs> and Preshy. Preshy. <laughs> that's really getting close to, like, somebody who do up-speak. I would, oh, that's so preshy. Don't you think <laughs> that's patchy? Sometimes. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, yes. no. Who am I to judge? Uh, oh, yeah, at, at, and, and Ray thinks there's a subtlety and nuance to this whole vocabulary you have that he would miss. Caller! Hello, hi. Hi, Lynn. Hi. Hey, but, you know, I'm only 46, and I took shorthand when I was in high school. Wow. And I still use it. Wow. And people think that it is, first of all, when they understand how that I can write as much as I can write with, just a, with a couple of short words or whatever, they think it's amazing. So, I mean, at one point, I believe at some point in time, someone must have thought shorthand was crazy or weird or 
unacceptable, uh, but it was something that was commonly taught, and and uh, and, I, 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 and and I think that it's about progression and about adding things that make life easier, and and it's hard to just I don't know just go back. It's it's, it's about move, uh, about moving forward, making progress. Okay, but I don't think of always moving. F- I don't think of moving forward and progress is necessarily the same thing. I mean, I think just because something is new, it doesn't mean it's better. Okay. <laughs> That's what I think. Thanks with the T-H-X, okay? Okay. <laughs> Bye. Ta-ta. Ta-ta. Um, and then Ray has added this from Lewis Carroll. When I use a word, Humpty Dumpty said, in rather a scornful tone, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. The question is, said Alice, whether you can make words mean so many different things. The question is, said Humpty Dumpty, which is to be master. That's all. Oh, my... Everything's so complicated. Okay, and now back to gravity, ladies and gentlemen, which has been an ongoing uh, subject throughout the week. Um, Corinne writes, I listen to Wednesdays and Thursdays podcasts back to back, and it is driving me crazy. Crazy's in big, big light. That's why I had to do that. Gravity is a constant acceleration. So if nothing else intervenes, two objects will accelerate at the exact same speed, 9.8 meters per second squared. And they will reach the ground at the same time. Force equals mass times acceleration. Weight is a force. Mass times gravity. I'm just reading words at this point because this is the kind of thing where my head just goes. Okay, so if weight is the only factor, two objects will fall at the same rate and reach the ground at the same time, even if their masses differ. However, other forces can come into play. If you dropped a typewriter and a feather which is what we were saying yesterday, they would still be accelerating at the same speed. But because they are shaped differently, wind resistance may form an upward force on the feather that would be different from that on the typewriter, thus slowing it down more. If you had two objects of the same shape but different masses, for instance, a ball filled with lead and a ball filled with feathers, they would hit the ground at the same time because no other force would slow them down. I understand that. I understand that. And then she gives me a YouTube thing to Mr. Wizard. Um, who explains this all. And I'll, I'll look at that when I'm home because that will probably um, help me. Thank you. Understand. <laughs> there is a f- blizzard out my window. Oh, my God. No. No. I'm sure it'll stop, Jess. I think it's what meteorologists call a squall. Squall. It's just a passing fancy. It is, to quote a word used by Mr. Sokolowski yesterday, ephemeral. Mm. It's passing by. Message has not been sent. What do you mean it's not been sent? I want it sent. Uh, uh, sorry. Okay, I'm back. Um, I believe uh, Margaret has written me something. I think she says, I keep saying that the general, stop saying the general got off. <laughs> is that is, is sort of a sexual <laughs> double entendre? Is that, is that, is that, that must have been the point, right? Stop saying the general is getting off. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Margaret, I will. But that's. That was the point, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, 
And they're going to make another movie about uh, jobs, Steve, um, because the one that a- with Ashton Kutcher was a to- total... And this one's going to be good because it's going to star. And isn't this perfect? Christian Bale. Really? Yeah. Isn't that perfect? That's perfect. I think so. Okay. The Reverend Fred Phelps of the uh, wonderful uh, Westboro Baptist Church of Topeka, Kansas, has gone on to meet his maker. And nobody's mourning that. Um... Oh, I've lost it. Son of a bitch. I wanted to read to you a piece, but at the rate my, uh, my, this damn computer works, I'm never going to get it back now. I must have inadvertently uh, gotten rid of it. A piece uh, written for Esquire uh, today, or yesterday, I suspect, by uh, Tom Junot, J-U-N-O-D, who is one of their... um, marvelous writers, Um, and he had written the sort of definitive piece on Fred Rogers, and I think I've I've pointed it out to you before, because when his editors told him they wanted him to do a piece on Fred Rogers, he looked at them like they were out of their minds, Um, and yet he did it. And came to Pittsburgh to interview Fred Rogers and was simply blown away by him and wrote this amazing story. I hate this computer. Excuse me. I'm not going to be able to find it. And he writes a piece about how when he came to Fred's memorial service, which was held at Heinz Hall, he, um, and I, I was at that service too, and Fred Phelps and his churchgoers were picketing Fred Rogers' funeral, as they do. And I know that uh, the Rogers family uh, suggested that nobody coming into the service um, speak to those people or or argue with them or confront them in any way. Just ignore them. Come on in and we'll just... But Junot wrote today in Esquire how he went over to see them and talk to them. And I'm not going to be able to, I was going to read it to you, but this computer simply will not bring my stuff up. I had it, and it's gone. Um, and it, it, I think it's titled The Tale of Two Freds, Fred Phelps, Fred Rogers. And the other thing about this despicable Phelps guy is that in the 50s and 60s, he was an attorney who represented a lot of African Americans in civil rights suits. So he began at some point as a sort of liberal liberal person fighting racism, and then he just must have un- I mean, just come apart in some manner. I I saw some quote, somebody who knew him saying he was a person so consumed with rage that, and, uh, you know, he found God at some point and it made him insane. He found the God of the Old Testament and, 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 and as he read that Old Testament, he saw a God that he thought really hated his creation, his people. And I think you can read uh, the Older Testament um, and make that case almost. Yeah, that was an angry God. So Phelps went that away. Anyway, now he's gone. 
His own church uh, disowned him last year and threw him out uh, because he apparently had done, committed some extraordinary heresy by suggesting that they um, get a little kinder and gentler. And they threw him out. But he schooled them, so it came back to, to get him. I, I'm sorry I even wasted any time talking about him. Forgive me. I had wanted to, though, share this really very wonderful juxtaposition that Tom Juneau did. But not to be. So I'm going out in this snowstorm. Dang. No, uh, I will not be on 4802 tonight. I, I don't think there is a 4802 tonight in case you must have some other kind of programming. And um, I got nothing else. Go pit in the unlikely hood that you can knock off the number one seed, but what the hell? You know, as we were saying before, we discount chance. And Pitt has a chance. I hate this spring! Mm -hmm. What kind of a spring is this? It's creating cognitive dissonance in my head. I wish you spring, warmth, love, beauty, and adieu. Lynn Coven Live, Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. and archived at pghcitypaper.com. The opinions expressed on Lynn Coven Live are those of the host and do not necessarily reflect the viewpoints of Pittsburgh City Paper, Steel City Media, and its advertisers.